Thank you for the introduction, James. So as James mentioned, this is the same talk I'm going to be giving next week on AutoWS. But what is nice is that today we actually have much more time. So feel free to ask like questions anytime if you want. And yeah, uh, I'm going to talk basically why we need kernel interposition over the network data plane. And this is joint work with like all these folks you see here. Many of them are actually part of the Crossroads research project. Okay, so for those that are not familiar with how a traditional kernel network stack works, here's how it looks more like in a very high level. So in this model, the kernel sits between the NIC and applications and mediates all the data transfers uh, between the, the network and these applications. And this model has been very successful, been used for many decades. And that's what you can see like in all the major operating systems today. The problem is that like, over the last 10 years or so, our NIC speeds have grown like significantly, but CPU performance started to plateau. So as a result, the kernel became a bottleneck to many network applications. And the reason the kernel performs poorly is because it has to pay overhead due to data movement. So it needs to copy data between the kernel space and user space and it also needs to pay the overhead of system calls. So like a natural alternative to this, and that have been proposed by many, many works, is to use a kernel bypass network stack. And the idea is simple. Instead of having the kernel mediating all the data transfers, we let these applications interface directly with the NIC. And as such, you have to implement the network stack as a library like inside the library, inside the application. And because you no longer have this data movement overhead, uh, the performance is, that we will get is way better. So there are many papers that like use some kind of, some variation of this strategy and they can get like much better performance. The problem is that a kernel bypass also leads to maintenance and manageability nightmare for administrators. And this nightmare really stands from the kernel bypasses inability to fully replicate kernel functionality. And to illustrate why this is the case, I'm going to show you some examples using Alice, who is a system administrator, and Bob, who is a newly hired intern. So Bob is quite happy. He just deployed his first application to production. The problem is that soon after he realizes that his application is sending too much traffic. And that is not leaving enough bandwidth for the database that is running on the same server. Well, but Alice knows what she has to do. All she needs to do is to prioritize traffic from the database over traffic from, Bob, from Bob's application. And for that, she can use tools like TC to start queuing disciplines inside the kernel. And because the kernel can oversee traffic from all these applications, it is able to enforce arbitrary queuing disciplines. So in this example, we can actually prioritize traffic from a database over Bob's application. But writing a very inefficient application wasn't the only mistake that Bob made. He also set a weak password and that caused the server to be compromised with a malicious web server. And again, Alice knows what she has to do. She can leverage the kernel's knowledge of all the open sockets in the system and use tools like Nextat or SS to find out exactly what application is causing the problem. And these are only two examples of the many policies and debugging capabilities that are made possible by the kernel's ability to interpose in all the data. Now, if you if you use a kernel bypass strategy, you no longer have kernel interposition and you're no longer able to enforce these policies or have centralized debugging capabilities. And there are existing alternatives that look at to fix some of these problems. So basically to reintroduce interposition to kernel bypass. <laughs> 
The problem is that they either cannot fully replicate kernel functionality or they need to compromise performance to do so. So for example, Google has a system called Snap that basically runs an network stack in a different core, like in a different process running in a different core. So what it does is it basically, it forces all the traffic from all applications to go through this separate process. And because this separate process runs with different privilege, it is able to reintroduce uh, these kernel policies that, that we lost with kernel bypass. The problem is that when it does that, it also has to reintroduce data movement overhead. Because now data has to hop between these different cores, either to reach the network or data coming from the network to reach the application. Another alternative that I have seen that also has in a position uh, is what Microsoft does with Axonet. And what Axonet does is to move a virtual switch to the NIC. And because this virtual switch can also interpose between application and the network, it is able to restore some of these policies as well. The problem is that vir the, this virtual switch only has visibility over virtual machines and not over applications. So that limits the types of policies that it's able to enforce. So for example, in the examples we saw before, when we wanna prioritize traffic from one application for the other, that's not really possible because all, all these virtual switches can see is that the traffic is coming from this virtual machine and not from the application. The other example where we have like, we're checking all the open sockets in the system. Again, that it's not possible because th that information lies with the kernel. And like the, this virtual switch do doesn't have access to that. Okay, so what do we really want? We want something that is logically like the kernel network stack while also being physically like kernel bypass. So we wanna be able to have kernel in a position without reintroducing data movement. So we want something that is on path. And our proposal to this is a new OS architecture that we call COPY. And COPY stands for kernel on path in a position. And it's a simple idea. We're going to leverage these new existing programmable smart NICs to implement a network data plane that is both on path while also being logically controlled by the kernel. And here's what it means more concretely. We're going to use a smart NIC in a CPU. And on the CPU, we're gonna run the kernel, which also acts as a control plane. And that kernel is also responsible for defining the functionality that runs in the copy data plane. So the way it does that is by installing the code that runs in the smart NIC itself. And that is in contrast with a traditional offload approach where we offload some functionality to the NIC, but that is defined by, by the hardware vendors and not the kernel developers. And the reason uh, having the kernel defining this functionality is essential is that data plane functionality changes all the time. So if you look at Linux alone, like in the last year alone, we saw like hundreds of new commits, either in network filters or in network schedulers. So these developers, these current developers expect to be able to change functionality uh, often. And our applications talk with the kernel for control plane operations and directly with the copy data plane for data plane operations. And right now we're starting to develop Norman, which is a new operating system that implements this copy architecture. And Norman really has uh, three main pieces. First, it has a this copy data plane that is implemented using an FPGA smart NIC. And that is responsible for all the logic, all the data plane functionality that requires in a position. So things like filtering, queuing disciplines, packet sniffing and others. And now the library is responsible for all the remaining data plane functionality that does not require in a position. 
And the kernel itself, which is based on Linux, uh, acts as a control plane. So it's responsible for all the control plane operations, like connection establishment and termination, as well as like conf uh, data plane configuration. And now, you as an administrator, if you want to set up like a new, a new rule, for example, like an IP table rule, you're going to continue to use the same tools you have today. And what changes is that the kernel not only is going to change its own data structures, but it's also going to configure this 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 rule in the COPE data plane itself. And that is true for other tools like TC. Also, debugging capabilities like SS or TCP dump to sniff packets. And now what happens is if the application wants to establish a new connection, it can do so by calling connect. And since it's a control plane operation, the library will direct this, this operation directly to the kernel. And then the kernel is responsible to, to check the policies to see if the application is able to open this connection. And also for configuring any required uh, policy or configuration in the data plane. And after this connection has been established, the application can go right to send data. And since that is a data plane operation, the library can direct that to the COPE data plane. So the last thing of the normal design that I wanna talk about is how it also enables unblocking IO. So one of the, another issue that we haven't discussed so far with kernel bypass is that since interrupts go to the kernel and now we're bypassing the kernel, the only way that kernel bypass applications can look for new data is by using something like polling. And with polling, what you do is that you're, you're constantly checking for new packets, even if you're not receiving anything. So this works really well when you're like receiving packets all the time, but when the application is idle, you're basically wasting CPU cycles, fetching new packets. Uh, if you're using network stack, like the kernel network stack instead, you can actually rely on interrupts. So when your application is not receiving any data, the application can block, and then the kernel wakes the application again when you receive data. And what is nice is that since uh, in Norman, the kernel is, is also aware of all the open connections in the system, we can also transfer control to the kernel when the application is not receiving enough data. So here's how it works. We have this shared notification queue that can be accessed by both the kernel and the library. And if the application reads, but there is no, no notification, there's shared notification queue, the library knows that there's no package to be read. Oh, you're at CMU. Oh. Someone is. No. This is hey, I'll, I'll take care of it. Okay. So, what happens is uh, if there is no data, the library can transfer control to the kernel. And now it's the kernel's responsibility for monitoring the shut notification queue. And when data finally arrives, uh, the kernel can wake, can wake the application right away. And then we continue for that. So that's how we, we can enable blocking IO with this design. Okay, so I wanna talk about a very high level overview of how Norman works. And there are many details that we're still working on and then some other challenges that we haven't figured out yet how to solve. And before we conclude, I'm just going to highlight two of those. The first thing that you may have noticed is that this design requires that we keep per connection state on the NIC. And since these smart NIC devices, they often have limited memory, it's unclear if we can scale this design to support enough connections. The other challenge is how we actually make an FPGA reconfigurable enough for our purpose. So we wanna be able to change not only configuration of the FPGA, but also functionality at runtime. And if you're, if you're using like a, a smart NIC with like a CPU core, uh, 
that is much more flexible. We can actually load new code and change functionality quite quickly. But FPGAs, they, they usually require you to like reconfigure the entire design to change functionality or use something like partial reconfiguration that gives you more flexibility in the, because you can actually change only parts of the design, but it's still not as fast or as flexible as having like a, a, a CPU core. So it's still like trying to figure out how to actually implement these functionalities in a way that can actually be flexibly changed at one time. So to conclude, I hope that I have convinced you that kernel interposition is essential. So having this design that bypasses the kernel, but then gives up all these features that operators and developers expect, is not really solving your problem. You also need to be able to re-implement these kernel features. And the copy architecture really gives you a path to restore the kernel interposition without reintroducing overheads. So with that, I thank you and I, I can take any questions.